Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, we chatted with Jasmine, an anthropologist and activist involved in the migrant solidarity and freedom of movement cultural organization called Maldusa, which is based in some of the southernmost reaches of Italy in Palermo, Sicily, and on the island of Lampedusa in the Mediterranean Sea. We speak for the hour about migration across the sea, what drives and draws people to make the treacherous journey, state, parastate, and civil institutions on both sides of the sea engaging in the issue of crossings and other topics. You can learn more about the project at maldusa.org slash en. And find links in the show notes for a few organizations mentioned in the show. Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair is back from COVID hiatus and will be held in Asheville, North Carolina from August 11th to the 13th. This year, we will be working once again with our comrades in Pansy Collective, who will complement days of workshops and tabling with evenings of queer music and parties. It's a special year as well, since we'll be helping our local collectively owned anarchist bookstore, Firestorm Books, inaugurate their new location at the hub for the book fair. Let's be honest, in the years since we last held space together, things have mostly gotten worse. An ongoing pandemic has killed millions and laid bare the organized abandonment that the state and capital has in store for most of us. Though we saw the biggest uprising in the U.S., which brought new tactics and new people into our movement, along with hyping the ideas of abolition to new ears, we have also seen a concerted effort to consolidate policing and and continue to funnel all public funding into the armed wing of the state. After a 50-year campaign by the right, Roe vs. Wade was finally overturned, reminding us that any right we think we have under the state can be taken away on a whim. This predicament is part of a broader sweep of white supremacist, Christo-fascist assaults on communities to force birth and protect the so-called Great Replacement, erase the history of slavery and racism from education, and to eradicate trans people, starting with kids. Armed militia protests at drag shows, books are banned, everything is tilted further and further towards overt fascism with no alibis. All the while, we are facing imminent collapse through capitalism's environmental destruction, with the irreversible date of shocking changes looming ever closer. And this is only some of what we faced. A signal flare in the movement, Stop Cop City, Defend the Atlanta Forest, has brought many of these fronts into focus as correlated struggles, becoming one of the most bold expressions of our strength and resistance, creating spaces where we can meet, make life, and confront the powers that want to destroy us. It has inspired support across the world, with people taking action in solidarity near and far, but has also, in its strength, brought down the violent hand of the state. We are at a pivotal moment with a comrade murdered and dozens of people facing intensified charges that try to defuse our movement and scare us away from fighting back. This will be a long fight that requires our energy and emotions and will call for new forms of solidarity to show the people facing these charges that we have their back, that we will not be silenced. Over these three years, we have loved and fought together. We have come together and broken up. Our lives have been utterly changed with so much grief and sorrow, along with the sparkling moments of joy that mark our rebellion from the streets to our dinner tables. Groups and actions have come and gone, new relationships blossom, old ones fade, and we get stronger as we see what helps us in our struggle and what no longer serves us. Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair invites you to participate in a space to share feelings, rage, and grief, joy and care, and everything we've learned over this pivotal moment of struggle. We wish to think together, to share tactics and ideas, to make connections for bolder actions, and to find love amongst comrades. There will be two days of tabling, three nights of workshops and speakers, and two nights of parties. So many places to plug in, to choose what catches your fancy, and to find each other across the room. Book fairs are an anarchist ritual space, an intentional coming together to learn from our ancestors and elders and the youth, to celebrate with comrades spread across the globe, and to practice new forms of devotion in our daily effort to build better worlds here and now. We welcome you to help us make this space something we will never forget. The applications are currently up for vendors and presenters and will remain open until June 15th. We invite radical presses, small distros, zine makers, and artists to sign up. We welcome proposals for workshops, panels, talks, and trainings towards a liberatory horizon. To apply, please visit our website, acabookfair.noblogs.org. To contact us, send an email to acabookfair at riseup.net, and please promote this event by following our social media or printing our flyers and handing them out in your community. Solidarity, ACAB Collective.
Would you please introduce yourself with any name, preferred gender pronouns, affiliations, or location info that could give good context for the conversation? Yeah. So I'm Jasmine, uh, pronouns she, her. And I'm part of Malduza Cultural Association in Italy and researcher in anthropology, currently based mainly in Italy. And is the subject matter of your research in anthropology related to the the work of Mal that Maldusa is engaged in? Yeah, it is. Um, my research is about civil search and rescue organizations in the central Mediterranean Sea. And I actually carried out uh, this research through deep participation on board of some ships. And I would say that actually, while I was doing my ethnography, I somehow became a rescuer myself. And yeah, I was not really involved in this kind of topics and activities before. But then since 2019, it has become definitely uh, the main part of my life. And Maldusa is an association that is absolutely focused on solidarity to freedom of movement and to people on the move. So yeah, my research and my activities with Maldusa are absolutely related, I would say. Yeah. And can you talk about what, like just sort of like what material and cultural work it does and, and also this concept of freedom of movement and why that's important? Yeah. So Maldusa is a cultural association based in Palermo in Sicily and in Lampedusa, a very small Italian island uh, that actually is uh, much closer to Tunisia than to Italy. And that is um, <clears throat> sadly famous for being the migrants island because it's actually one of the main point of arrivals in Italy from the North Africa. With Maldusa, we started actually not even one year ago. So we are a very new, young organization. And uh, our first aim is to create infrastructures for solidarity to people on the move. And what does it mean? <laughs> first of all, to practically in Lampedusa and in Palermo, to do qualitative research and documentation, trying to denounce the deadly management of borders in Europe and specifically in Italy. Lampedusa is a very clear example of this management. And if in Palermo we have a space um, that is a, uh, let's say, a material space in which we try to make together different struggles with different communities. And we try to let them overlap and cross each other, creating events together and to dialogue with the shared topics and to do shared denounces. At the same time in Lampedusa, we try with our, with our presence on the ground to be a critical and political gaze on what is going on there. Because actually there, it's full of humanitarian organizations or European agency taking care of uh, asylum procedures or migrants uh, reception. But what was missing somehow was a bit of a um, critical political presence and to be active on the ground. That means to try to have how to say, how to understand, on the one hand, what is needed to the people that cross the island. And so to try to uh, see these needs and to uh, respond to that and to claim for the respect of rights on the one hand, but also all for, for the needs to, for the tools that people need to cross in a dignified way, in a safe way, um, the, the path they want to, to do. So in Lampedusa also we, we organize cultural events, we try also to get involved a bit the part of the population on the island and to build together some shared uh, perspective, critical perspective on migration, on management of the borders, management of migration and so on. We also aim to have a presence at sea to document and testimony uh, the continuum of border violence uh, that is at, at land, but is also at sea. And we refer to this concept of freedom of movement that is also part of uh, our slogan. Of course, taking the concept from the transborder struggles since, I mean, many years, but also practically thinking that we would like to build a world in which actually there are no borders used as tool of separation, exclusion or control of people. 
all people, uh, so not only people, all the people should move or stay uh, as they as they want, as they can. And because there is no reason why I, with my privileged Italian passport that I have with no have for it, I would say, um, I can go wherever and someone else just because he's born somewhere else uh, cannot. So the point is not only, uh, let's say, about the refugees status or conventions or visas themselves, let's say not about the technical legal uh, details, our is more a political struggle. Uh, that means that we want to fight for a world in which everyone uh, has the freedom to stay, to live, to move. And I mean, of course, it's necessary to deal with reality in the daily life. And so, of course, there are borders, there is national states, there is uh, all the apparatus from the national state. And we actually do deal with that every day. Every time we, we have to also give tools to the people to facilitate the, their path, we actually do that. But still, because we have to do a lot of compromises in the practical day, daily life, we want to at least propose and to think and to, pr to try to, ch to challenge the reality, thinking about maybe a bit utopic, but still a uh, kind of word in which there is no this kind of tool to exclude and control. That kind of cultural and imaginary work feels very uh, in order to work on like what, and, and the dialogical element of engaging with the people and asking what their needs are and working to come to an understanding. And the people who live there also have needs, obviously, as well, who've been living in, in uh, Palermo and in um, these spots, Lampedusa. You mentioned that there are other organizations that are doing work in like in the same areas as you all are. Uh, a couple of others that come to my mind and that I've heard of are Sea Watch and Alarm Phone. And I wonder if you could tell us, uh, does Maldusa relate to those projects? Maybe a little bit about what they are uh, and what they do. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> um, Maldusa um, is actually made of individuals that are coming from different organizations with uh, at least a background of search and rescue, civil search and rescue um, activities or experiences, or different networks of solidarity to people on the move. So for example, there are people um, of Alarmfun, as you said, of the Biofal community that is based in Palermo, but also from the Luis Michel organization, and from Mediterranea Saving Humans, that is an Italian search and rescue organization. There are not directly people um, who are involved in Sea-Watch, but we are, let's say, part of the same family because, um, so, Alarm Phone is hotline that was created in 2014 and they receive calls of distress and they relay them to the authorities and to NGOs to push the authorities to do what they have to do and is a completely um, volunteer organization and these people are doing shift uh, the all day, all night and try to support and amplify the voices of those in danger at sea uh, who risk to not be assisted. And so they don't directly work at sea, but they are one of the most important support organizations to cooperate for search and rescue. On the other hand, the other organization you mentioned, Sea Watch, is one of the biggest and more important organizations of search and rescue in the civil fleet, as we call the fleet of the civil actors active in the central Mediterranean. They are mainly from Germany and they are one of the also the biggest uh, organization and they are at sea since uh, 2015 if i'm not wrong so also one of the uh, older <laughs> of the of the family but as i said let's say that so far maldusa is very young so i can say that in this moment let's say who created maldusa was coming mainly from mediterranea with michel alanfon and biofel people but of course if tomorrow there is is anyone from other organization who wants to participate with us in this, uh, let's say, political uh, program? We are more than open and we want absolutely to be part of this collaboration process. 
Could you give a brief background on the immigration from over the last decade since the so-called Arab Spring and civil wars across North Africa and West Asia, and how these movements of people have, have shaped the European border regime? So for sure, my answer will not be correct. <laughs> it, it will be just a little piece. And I think it's a very complex question. But so briefly, I will try. <laughs> Let's say that after 2011 and then after 2015, for sure, Europe had to deal in a different way with migration, at least different from how it was before. And even if, let's say, Fortress Europe is building her walls since 90s, uh, externalizing the frontiers and the violence to assure a kind of safety inside in a way that I would define as a clearly a white Western colonizer. <laughs> but uh, for sure, in the last years, the situation has become very visible, more visible than before. Even if I think that actually it's also useful uh, when we think about Europe to use also the metaphor not only of the fortress, but also the one of the filter, because mm, it's not actually close to everyone. I mean, goods and rich people can always uh, move everywhere. And actually, also poor people, black people from the South, it's not that they cannot enter. They cannot enter legally, but actually, exactly creating this way of, how to say, I mean, let's say that uh, what European governments are doing is exactly to create the condition to put people in danger, to arrive in Europe and then to let them die in this danger as it is happening in this moment in the central Mediterranean and not only, or on the other hand, to put them in the position once they arrive to be exploited, for example, with the black work. So I would use these two levels to read the complexity of the situation. And for sure, there are several uh, conventions for refugees and I mean Europe is also I mean is always thought as the country on the continent of human rights and uh, reception and welcome countries but most of the convention we have are actually absolutely old-fashioned and are not able to deal with the reality we are facing in this moment so for example, I mean, the um, Convention of Geneva from 1951, that is absolutely important and is the one that is defining the status of refugee, that is fundamental, okay, to define who can enter and how and uh, for which detail. But actually, it's very old because it's re it refers to individuals and it was thought after the Second World War. But today, you cannot think as an individual phenomenon, the one of migration, and the, re the refugee status was not created about migration as it is today. On the other hand, another important convention is the Dublin Convention that says that um, people have to obtain documents, more or less, in the first country in Europe they arrive. That is crazy because, of course, <laughs> geographically speaking, are so few the, the countries in which people, people arrive. And it doesn't make any sense to push them and to force them to stay there until they obtain the documents. So I would say that the point is that there, there have been a lot of changement. And since 2011, also the uh, people who arrive have changed a lot. For example, there was a majority of uh, quite young male coming. 10 years ago, and today we have an absolutely high number of women with children. And often they are alone. Maybe they are the wife of the man that arrived 10 years ago. But I don't want to talk about numbers. That's not the point. I just want to say that even if people will change, roots will change, and uh, most probably also the reason to move will change, still in this moment in Europe, we don't have a proper way to deal with this strange thing called migration. And so it has changed a lot, but I would say that what I can see is that the management is even more securitarian and deadly. Well, can you talk a little bit about some of the people that are coming now and what's motivating them? Some of the 
countries that you're seeing a lot of people come from, some of the motivations that they've spoken about, or, or some of the things that they're either moving towards or moving away from? So um, in this moment, also the roots are changing a lot. So for example, in Italy, until one year ago, people were mainly coming from Libya and where they were forced sometimes for year to stay in centers of detention. But in the last year, something has changed and this route has moved a lot to Tunisia. So in this moment, we have a lot, not only of Tunisian people, that was our old story, but also sub-Saharan people coming towards Europe from Tunisia. And that's quite interesting because sometimes you arrive to Tunisia with flights because uh, Tunisia has some visa agreements with different countries so some people can just arrive from sub-saharan countries with a flight or sometimes they come by feet uh, from algeria or sometimes in very different ways sometimes from libya i mean different routes i think that still tunisia is one of the main country where people are coming from and Cote d'Ivoire and Cameroon, Gambia, Senegal are, I mean, more or less are part of the main people in the, in, in the Tunisian route. But of course, there are still or the Bangladesh and Syria and Syria uh, from um, the east side, let's say. I'm not talking about the Balkanian route. That is uh, another topic, let's say. But in the Central Med, these are the main nationalities. So, of course, some of these countries are countries with war. And, I mean, we can talk about it or not. But what I want to say is that actually a lot of the countries where these people are coming from are exactly the countries that in Italy we consider safe country of origins. And it means that actually maybe there is no war but maybe LGBTQ um, rights are not respected, just to say something, or maybe there is very tough um, social or economical crisis, but that's just not recognized. So I think it's not only about war, it's also about social economical situations, but I would also like to stress the point that it's not about only desperation when people decide to live. And it's about desires and imaginaries and dreams. And exactly as I decide to go to France to do my master, and I can, it should be possible for all of that of them to just say, hey, I want to live today. I will go to the embassy and tomorrow I live. Just because I have the money to do, maybe, you know? But the point is that they can't because the visa... Uh, management and polit policies are really uh, making it impossible for most of the people from these countries to come. And so these illegal um, routes are actually not necessarily coming from desperate situations. It's just that it's impossible to come here in a legal way. Even if you want just to study, even if you are coming from a quite well family, you know, so... Of course, there are several very tough and problematic situations, and we should also take the responsibility of our neocolonial economical responsibility in most of the countries in Africa. So, of course, we have to look at that and to understand it and maybe to learn something. But at the same time, I think it's very important to, to see that sometimes is absolutely not about war or desperation. And for clarification, so when we've talked on the show about like the colonial or neo-colonial relationship with countries that we see a lot of, like the majority of immigrants coming to the U.S. from tend to be in Latin America. And the United States has, has, a, has had a policy since the early 1800s of to varying degrees of controlling markets, labor, political formations throughout this hemisphere to the exclusion of, for the most part, of, of European powers. We talk about the relationship that the U.S. has had, particularly in the 20th century, of engaging, of destabilizing political formations, governments, nation states, whatever, that have had, or, or social movements that have had interests that have run counter to parts of the ruling classes depending on what time and what place in the United States. And uh, yeah, I wonder if you could say a few things about that sort of uh, relationship that Italy has with North Africa or that 
uh, people in Europe have with some of the countries and the sort of like what Walter Rodney talked about with the underdevelopment of former colonies and the wealth that's existent within the walls of Fortress Europe. Yeah, I just sprung that on you. So, so if you I don't want that to answer I... it, that's okay. It's kind of a blah. No, no, don't worry. We try and then uh, we see. But I, w- I would say that actually it's even more related maybe than U.S. somehow. Because if you think, for example, about the relation between France and Tunisia or France and Algeria, of course, it's really also not so old actually. And um, the same if you think about Senegal and France, or even if you think about Italy and Eritrea. So, um, I mean, in Italy, actually, we have this big problem that colonialism uh, never existed somehow, and we don't recognize it, we don't know anything about it. I mean, it's true that most probably uh, we failed even in being colonizers, but uh, still, Um, it's quite interesting to see also the different relations that are going on in Africa because of uh, our colonization. And for example, one point that was very interesting for me and I think can explain very well is that, for example, some Eritrean guys told us that when they were in Libya trying to reach Europe, they were treated by people of Libya, Libyans, particularly bad because when Italy was in Eritrea, was using um, Eritrean soldiers to occupy Libya. And that's why somehow this colonial past is coming again. And so Eritrea is actually facing for a second time this uh, Italian uh, past uh, on, on them. So... I mean, that's just an example that is also a bit symbolic and maybe also a narrative one somehow. Um, But still, it was very strong when someone told you exactly this. And so I think it's, again, I I think we, we, we also have always to keep together one level that is about imaginaries, let's say, and one that is about practices. So I'm not sure that every person that decides to leave Senegal has a very clear... Um, understanding or political position against col- French colon- col- colonizers. I'm not sure about that. But I would also say that I don't care so much because I think that's not the point. I don't know if in the practices of the everyday practices they directly fight against this. The point is that in the more wider geopolitical relationship, we can still see that very well. So I think, I mean, I'm an anthropologist, so usually I work with imaginaries and with the cultural parts of people. And so I think that for me, the main point is also to understand why Europe is the place where people want to go. And I mean, it's actually easy, no? I mean, we spend a lot of time to explain them that somehow our place was better than theirs. And of course, at one point, most probably people will want to join us and so it's interesting also to see how they shape sometimes the idea of Europe or the idea of what they will found here or how they deal with the um, storytelling about what they find in Europe to their families that stay there and of course the narration of what they found sometimes is very far away from the reality so again I think that the point is um, how to say Uh, a cultural colonialization. And that's what we have to fight firstly. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts. And here's a jingle from another member of CZN. to Dissident Island Radio. Live every first and third Friday of the month at 9pm GMT. Check out www.dissidentisland.org for downloads and more.
yeah, you've talked about, you've mentioned the management of immigration and how how it's being engaged and the material side of this from from the European side of things. And I think that, as you say, like the the routes that are taken across the water or through the Balkans or what have you change according to policy changes and political shifts of the governments that have hegemony in those areas. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about who's opposing the immigrant boats, what coast guards, like I know I've, I've heard about recently, like Greece redepositing people back in the Mediterranean or uh, people trying to force the Italian government to engage and try to save people. Or there's also Frontex as, as an agency, which a lot of people in my audience, mostly in North America, maybe not familiar with that, but there's also right-wing endeavors. There was back in the 2017, 2018 period, I know there were right-wing civil society groups that were going out into the ocean and attempting to disrupt people's roots north. I wonder if you could just talk about like this. And if you want to talk about the imaginary of like what they're besides the bureaucracy and the rules that they're facing, like what, what they're so afraid of. Yeah. So I would say that it's a bit different uh, in different countries. So the situation about the Coast Guard in Italy, for example, is quite different from the one in Greece. But yeah, let's try to to say something general. So, or maybe no, I will go specifically and then I will go general later. So for sure, yes, in Greece, there is a situation that is quite tough. And we have some evidences from some days ago, actually, of Coast Guard really taking people from land, taking them on a boat and then leaving them uh, at sea. So, um, I mean, that's crazy. It's unbelievable, but that's true. And um, also Frontex, that is the <clears throat> European agency for board and cost control. There are evidences that has facilitated this kind of um, pushback or pullback that are absolutely illegal, considering international law in Europe. And that's the same that actually is happening also with the so-called Libyan Coast Guard. So I say so-called because, um, let's say, in the civil actors um, operating at sea in the central med. We don't recognize the Libyan Coast Guard as a Coast Guard, uh, firstly, because um, uh, they don't, I mean, they don't have a proper structure. They are not trained to really save lives, but more to uh, enforce law. And what they do is not rescue, but just a pullback. And that's exactly what Italy is financing, giving a lot of money and tools and ships and people and trainings. And the idea, ex what I said before also now, to externalize this management. And as you, you can say that out of sight, out of mind somehow, no? So uh, even if in Italy, uh, the Coast Guard is absolutely doing a great job and actually rescuing a lot of people, still the government is absolutely facilitating the pullback in Libya. And actually now is going on the same thing also with Tunisia. That is, let's say, a new thing because interceptions from the Tunisian Coast Guard is a kind of new, of new thing. But of course, with increasing of the um, numbers of people coming from Tunisia, uh, Italy is now having new agreements with Tunisia also to reinforce um, the, um, the tools of, um, sorry, it's not the Coast Guard of Tunisia, actually is a Guard Nacional that actually is police. So also, again, it's not search and rescue, it's not saving life, it's law enforcement. So I think that's also quite interesting because what they do is uh, they, they can't, you know, I mean, their ships are not built to do rescue. And that's why also most of the times they create shipwrecks and people die just because they are approaching them, you know. So... I think that is one of the points that is directly related to the externalization and then it becomes very practical and technical, but is absolutely related to what actually right movements and right also parties actually feel even at land. So I cannot give an answer, of course, of why or which is the fear. I mean, there are several theories, there are several understandings. I am... I feel that I'm so so deep and so young in this situation that I cannot really judge somehow. But of course, there is 
we, we have to consider also some kind of uncertainty and crisis that still, even if it's very different, but also in Italy somehow is going on. And this struggle among the, the poorest is something that is absolutely not new. So I, I really don't want to give banal answers. So I will not give an answer about this. But it's clear that it has also changed again since 2017, 2018. Because when, for example, in Italy in 2017, there were the first measures uh, criminalizing the humanitarian solidarity, there was also a big wave of solidarity coming back. Today, we still have another very right-wing government, but the reaction also from the civil society is quite different. So I would say that on the one hand, maybe it's less polarized as also discussion, because when in 2018, the discussion was very, very polarized and maybe also simplified. Nowadays, I would say that it's a bit more complicated. Our government is also acting in a very interesting way, I would say, because on the one hand, they are completely dismantling and destroying the reception system, and they are claiming for the arrest of all the traffickers all over the world and to block all the ships and something like this. But then if you see, the Coast Guard has made more rescue in the last year, actually in the last six months, since there is the new government, than in the last years. And they are going much farther south in the also outside of the Italian search and rescue zone in the Maltese one to do the rescues. So, I mean, I didn't say also anything about Malta that is another interesting case because on the one hand, we have a lot of cases which actually Malta is um, collaborating directly with Libya to organize pullbacks uh, against any <laughs> law, any right, anything. But again, it's very complex and it's very sometimes invisible what is going on. So I think that what is interesting now is that, of course, for me, for the people of the bubble, we say, of course, that is a very big topic. But I would say that is very different from 2018 when it was a public opinion topic. Nowadays, it's a bit different. And even if there was, as you probably know, this big shipwreck in Crotone in Italy, in Calabria, and it was something very strong, very tough also because it was very close to the coast of Italy. And so I think it has somehow um, changed something no? also in the government measures. But still, we're not in the same situation of 2018. And so also the reaction is different. So if you're seeing more rescues by the Italian Coast Guard, for instance, um, but the, I guess the central government is dismantling the reception centers, where are people going? Are they just being immediately deported back to quote unquote safe third party countries? That would be the idea. So they declare this. So they would like to increase the deportations. We are um, in the situation in which we are really interested in understanding how they want to do that. And also considering that they have, I guess, no funds to do that. But still, one month ago, uh, Italy declared the state of emergency about migration. And it means to have a lot of funds to manage uh, the emergency, so-called, that is absolutely not an emergency, a political choice, but still they call it like this. So, I mean, let's see. On the one hand, we can see, for example, in Lampedusa, that um, with this state of emergency decrees, actually they change it. For example, the management of the hotspot that is there for the first uh, reception of uh, the people on the move, and actually, they put the um, Italian Red Cross as a manager. And in two weeks, they changed everything, okay? They destroyed and rebuilt the, the construction. And they put a lot of new services and new things saying that for them, the aim is to give a dignified reception to these people. Because one of the points in Lampedusa is that also... Um, these hotspots get super overcrowded because the transfer to Sicily are very slow and not every day and etc. So now they are trying to do transfer every day with flights, with ferries, with whatever. So on the one hand, actually, you can say that with this state of emergency is giving some of the basic tools that actually we were forced to claim for because they were not there, not even them. 
So on the one hand, they are giving these basic services. And so, of course, we are happy because people will find a more dignified situation once they arrive. But still, uh, the point is that it's the management itself that is not working. You cannot people in prison because they are prison. And so I think, it, I mean, it's tricky, you know, also to go against something that starts to work in a way that is dignified. So let's see how it works. And let's see also what happens to the people, because it's a news from yesterday that they maybe want to build a center for repatriation in Lampedusa itself. So, you know, let's see what will happen. We are here exactly to, how to say, to observe and to be ready to denounce. <laughs> So you've talked about how it's like a very particular situation and very changing and shifting with the independent like national governments that of the countries that lined the European coast. But I can you talk a little bit about the how that border area looks along the ocean because I'm sure that there's a lot of arguments around national autonomy by the countries that are along the border that might conflict with a border organization that is not controlled by the populations or by the national governments directly of those places. Can you talk a little bit about Frontex and how Frontex operates and where it kind of fits in relation to these Coast Guards? Yeah, so actually I would say that this situation is somehow easier than how we could expect. Because of course, I mean, for what is our interest now, uh, we have national waters and we have international waters. And we have search and rescue zones. And a search and rescue zone is a part of the water, of the sea, in which a state has the duty to coordinate search and rescue operations. Mm, the search and rescue zone uh, overlaps with the international waters. So, for example, Italian search and rescue zones has a part of it that is international waters and a part of it that is in, in the Italian national waters. I mean, of course, in the national waters, it will be the state to take care of uh, search and rescue, but in the part of the international waters that would be otherwise empty and with no control, uh, every state can decide by themselves and declare which are the coordinates of the zone they want to take care of. It doesn't mean that they are the only one allowed to do research or rescue or they, have, they are the only one who can coordinate. No, it's just that they are the one in charge of do that once they are called to do that. Actually, um, so it's quite easy, let's say. Usually the National Coast Guard is acting, of course, in the national waters and then in the search and rescue area of that nation. That means also international waters. Of course, there is no search and rescue zone of one state overlapping with the national waters of another state. That's clear. So in this scenario, at the moment, the situation is that actually because every state can declare their own search and rescue area and they just need to have a center for the coordination of it at land, um, in 2018, Libya, because of all the financing and the help of Italy, was in the position to declare their search and rescue zone. That is absolutely huge and impossible for them to actually control and to actually be effective doing rescue. That's quite similar also for Malta. They have a huge search and rescue zone and they never go out. So the situation at the end of the day is that actually there is miles and miles in which nobody go to do search and rescue. But most important, actually nobody take the command about the coordination of the search and rescue. So Frontex. Uh, Frontex actually is collaborating with the European countries technically to um, control the borders and to enforce uh, the law of controlling the borders. So it means that on the one hand, what they told us is that, for example, they cannot enter in the Tunisian territorial waters, for example. But of course, once they are in international waters and in European search and rescue areas, they should collaborate with the authorities and, for example, say if they found a boat in distress, for example. 
What happens is actually that they most probably do that, but we don't know as civil society. And the main problematic thing is that actually not only they collaborate with, for example, the Libyan Coast Guard to facilitate the pullbacks, but they don't communicate with search and rescue um, civil organizations. And that means that in, in a lot of cases, even if there are uh, NGOs out at sea able to do rescue, because Frontex was not communicating about the case, they were pulled back or they just sunk. So the point is exactly this, and it's in between of like facilitating pullbacks and not communicating and so facilitating shipwrecks. Yeah, oh, that's so dire. So you had mentioned how the newer explicitly right-wing government in Italy has been changing the reception and the processing of migrants who are seeking refuge uh, or, or transiting through, trying to transit through Italy at least. I wonder like how much Besides, like that's a concrete example of a shift in maybe not like spoken policy, but but concrete policy. Do you see much of a big difference between leftist regimes and right wing regimes in or centrist regimes in Italy, for instance, where you're based in terms of policies towards immigration? Is there like a big shift according to how this is engaged or does at the national level, do you see like the bureaucracy is just sort of entrenched and exists throughout different political electoral turns? So I think it's a quite interesting question because the answer is much complicated. So on the one hand, I would say that I didn't see so much shift uh, from right to left and then to right again parties at the government. But I'm not sure it's just because of bureaucracy that is actually pervading everything. I would say that actually the problem is that, I mean, left-wing parties in Italy are not really left-wing parties, I would say. So I actually would remember that uh, one of the first uh, bays for criminalization of solidarity was in 2017 with our left-wing government in Italy. So I think that what happened later was this game of right, left, right, left, but actually, I mean, the, the process was just going on. I think there is also another level. And so about this, I would say that the point is more neoliberal, securitarian way to manage migration and doesn't matter if it's right or left. But then I would also say that, of course, that bureaucracy is actually something that is going everywhere. And of course, it's becoming much more difficult also for the ones who would like to change something and to oppose some laws to do that because it's really becoming a technical thing. But that's also the point that in my perspective, even if, of course, it's very important to fight against technicalities and to um, go against them and to claim for some changements, still, one of the main problems about management of migration, in my perspective, is exactly that it's becoming a really technical, juridical struggle. And even if, of course, we can talk a lot about how radical power can be in juridical struggles, and we can, and we can talk about how laws can go against the state and whatever, and specifically about the sea, it's quite interesting because you can play with different levels of laws, with international law, with national so and so on. But still, I think it's important to focus on the fact that we have to have in mind a political struggle that is different than the technical one. And to keep them together, it's quite tricky and I think that sometimes humanitarian uh, organization and solidarity organization lose a bit this point because it's a very complex moment to do that. Because on the one hand, you are attacked as a humanitarian worker, let's say. And so the, I don't know how to say, but the level is becoming lower and lower. And so the political chance to change something, to talk about a real radical changement and revolution is really, really taken apart. And I think it's exactly the game they want to, to play. I wonder if we couldn't jump back to the to the work of Maldusa. And can you talk about some of the ways that you've engaged with some of the people in Lampedusa or um, in Palermo who aren't transiting through? 
around the issues of migration? Like, how have you found who've grown up on the islands or in the area to be engaging with this dynamic and with the people coming through? Sorry, you you mean the people of Maldusa or you mean the people in Lampedusa engaging with organizations? Uh, the people in Lampedusa. I'm wondering how, because you you were talking, it sounded like before, uh, working around the imaginary, working around the cultural and political side of, of migration, of freedom of movement, there's... You know, there's the people that are coming through, there's the government that's engaging, there's the NGOs and civil society groups, but there's also the people that live in the area also. And I'm wondering, are you finding that people that are living there are feeling conflicted? Are they feeling welcoming? Are they feeling, I mean, I'm sure they're feeling lots of ways because they're people and they're complex, but... Yeah, so I think that the first point for me was uh, the first time I arrived in Lampedusa was that I was expecting... um, an island, and so a, pe- a kind of population, you know, like a bubble. Also because they are like 5,000 people and 1,200 are different authorities. 1,200 on 5,000. So I thought, okay, I mean, 3,500 3, people, they will all know each other and they will all be friends. Come on. Not true. So the main point in Lampedusa is that actually there are really several different perspectives, different points of view. And of course, it's obvious because we are all different human beings. But what was, I think, very interesting is that there is actually not one island of Lampedusa position about migration. Let's say that for sure, Lampedusa has been, as every newspaper says, an island of solidarity for a long time. And that's actually true. I mean, there were a lot of people that just for this human compassion, let's say, were just going out and saving people from the water. And then maybe hosting them at their place and giving them the possibility to have a shower, to cut their hair and to just being with there. That was around, I, I would say, until 2013. Then after the big shipwreck of 2013, the 3 of October, something has changed completely. And Lampedusa became the island of the shipwreck, and but also the island of the European management of migration in Lampedusa. And it became the island of the border, the island of the, bo- of the frontiers, and it became a militarized area. It was already, um, but in that moment, something has changed more and more. And what most of the people in Lampedusa say is that somehow Europe or the state, usually they say the state, took away from them the management of migration. And that's exactly why now they don't feel engaged to that. And so the reaction today are, I don't care, they should die, or it's not my problem. And there is very few people who are still actually engaged and in solidarity and taking care in the daily life of this but the feeling that i that i had and it's my perspective okay i cannot talk for them but um it's a kind of um, tiredness and um, exasperation on the one hand because they feel abandoned from the state and on the other hand to be over controlled by the state because for example in Lampedusa they don't have an hospital and of course for people it's quite tough to not have an hospital and on the one hand you could say okay but actually if you see other islands in Italy with the same numbers same people blah 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 I mean there are other islands in Italy with no hospital but Lampedusa is one of the most distant islands from Italy. And it means that if you have any kind of emergency, you have to take a flight of one hour or 12 hours ferry. That's not easy. It's since 90s that in Lampedusa, babies cannot get born. I mean, women cannot deliver in Lampedusa. So the question is, the, the famous question, no? why migrants can have an hospital in the hotspot and we can't? Why migrants can be transferred for free and we have to pay? Why? So a lot of questions in which actually was created a, a kind of competition, of course. I mean, it's a very usual way no, to manage. So 
there is this. And another point is also that I felt a lot of kind of conspiracy theories. Because of course, when you feel abandoned from the state, you, you have to explain reality in a different way. And you have to find answers to your questions. And so I think that is true sometimes when they say something like, ah, racist people, Italian, Southern people, <laughs> there is something about this, but actually it's more complex than this. And so on the one hand, there is also people who learn how to exploit, let's say this, and so they created a kind of business on that. And of course, I mean, the management is also a business for them on the island. If you think about food, if you supplies or whatever, of course, also people of the island earn money on this. And also the tourism, a lot of tourists come to Lampedusa because they want to see black people. They want to see the disembarkations. And there are several people taking pictures of them with the swimsuits and with the partner on the beach, beautiful beaches in Lampedusa, close to the shipwrecked boat. And that's creepy, no? But still, there are people who buy their flight to Lampedusa because they want to see migrants. They, and they are disappointed when they cannot see them because actually they are all imprisoned in the hotspot. So I think there are several dynamics, several tensions, and I would say you can find everything in Lampedusa. You can find the more, most activist person and you can find a very racist person. I think that is a very deeply... Uh, intertwined currents in Lampedusa and it's a very clear symbol of the how you should not manage a border well that's the that's the questions that I had for you uh I wondered was there anything that I didn't ask about that that you think we should talk about right now while while we're on this this call uh, actually I feel we we talk a lot of <laughs> things no i mean so far i i don't feel something that i need to say okay okay i didn't know if there were glaring holes in, in the questions that i asked thank you very much for having this conversation taking the time and for the work that you do i really appreciate it there's the website and i'll link that i think it's just um www.maldusa.org yeah our yeah. audience slash en are there any other ways that people can follow or make donations to support the work that you're doing? Yeah, so there is a Facebook, Twitter and Instagram page and they are all Maldusa Project. And for donations, we have uh, in the website, we have a page that is support us and there there is the details in case they want to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much and take care of yourself. Thank you so much. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. I interrupt my regularly scheduled segment to announce that some nameless coward fart goblin here at the Ohio State Penitentiary intercepted the email transmission of my June 11th statement this year. I guess that means my June 11th statement is so powerful the hierarch delusion would implode if the world could read it. And that means I have a moral duty to recite the whole thing right here. Please feel free to forward this audio to folks at june11.noblogs.org and to Fire Ant and to censoring fascists who work for the Ohio Department of Retribution and Corruption so that they know the truth can't be stopped no matter how much they oppose it. So, um, yeah, here's my June 11 statement that was censored by prison fascists. <coughs> Today is June 11 a day of solidarity with Marius Mason and long-term anarchist prisoners. I think my experience is indicative of the situation that confronts all of us right now. It is instructive regarding the nature and character of this larger system. In 1991, I was prosecuted for premeditated murder after stabbing and killing someone who broke into my home and threatened my life. His name was Andrew Crouch. He was the ex-boyfriend of my then-girlfriend, and the two of them had been squabbling over Crouch's visitation of their son. Crouch was also the nephew of the clerk of courts, who was also the chair of the local Democratic Party, to which the county judge and prosecutor both belonged. Both Judge Ann B. Mashari and Prosecutor Kevin J. Baxter were Democrats, and the longevity of their careers hinged on the approval of Colette Crouch the aunt of the man I killed. Prosecutor Kevin J. Baxter hid Crouch's criminal record. K. 
concealed photos of the break-in damage and then claimed no break-in occurred, solicited provably false testimony from witnesses with axes to grind, and life-flighted Crouch's dead body two counties away to get a pro-cop coroner to lie and say Crouch was stabbed from behind when he provably was not. He also got a warrant to seize a Ouija board from my parents' home in order to tell the jury I was a Satan worshiper. For my part, I had no criminal record, not so much as a record of traffic tickets. I passed a polygraph. I was the first murder suspect in Ohio released on a bond payment of $2,000 since 1929, and I didn't run. It wasn't until my retrial years later that we realized the depth of Kevin J. Baxter's cover-up, the concealment of the break-in, the deliberate fabrication of the stab-from-behind narrative, the solicitation of provably false testimony. But even on retrial, the fix was in. Baxter convinced the judge on retrial to defy the higher court and conduct the retrial even more unfairly than the first one. And somehow, inexplicably, on appeal, the judge who reversed my initial conviction was mysteriously and irregularly removed from my appeal and replaced by a longtime ally of Colette Crouch, the aunt of the man I killed. Rubber stamp, appeal denied. I came to prison for a provable non-crime, a weaponized prosecution designed and engineered to get a predetermined outcome. Petty vengeance and a pound of flesh in exchange for political favors. It was mind over matter. The powerful didn't mind. The powerless didn't matter. A comprehensive documentary about my case is being produced on YouTube. You can find it by searching out at political prisoners on YouTube.com. Also, it seems Prosecutor Kevin J. Baxter has what appears to be a long pattern of corrupt behavior. That is now the topic of a website, www.theexposer.com the-exposer.com According to that site, Baxter has used his power and extorted women into coercive sexual relationships, has profited from the local drug trade, and has used his office to silence anyone who dares to question his non-existent integrity, including his own brother, whom Baxter prosecuted for stepping forward. But that's not why I'm still locked up in 2023. No. The Ohio Parole Board itself admitted in my last hearing that they no longer care about that. What they care about is my outspoken critique of their system, which they carefully couch in terms of misconduct rather than free speech. A critical disjuncture in my experience of captivity occurred in 2012 when I publicly exposed the prison's director, Gary C. Moore, for what was likely criminal misconduct. More outsourced services to a private predatory profiteer and what likely constituted hundreds of thousands of instances of identity theft when he handed over private information of Ohio citizens to a private company. In retaliation for exposing Moore's identity thefts, prison officials framed me as a gang leader and had me tortured for a year, a regimen of domestic torture that included a sexual assault component. All of this was run by right-wing, hate-mongering extremists in charge of the Ohio prison system, who, in turn, answered to FBI Special Agent Frank Figliuzzi, also a right-wing hate-monger who targeted anarchists. Turns out the FBI used the outsourced services as a metadata collection tool, so my exposure of Gary Moore's crimes also implicated the FBI's source information provider. Framing me as a gang of one, since no one but me was listed as a member of the gang in the entire Ohio prison system, and creatively reinventing my articulated criticism of the hierarch program, journalism equals terrorism, they wage an openly ideological war against me that hurricanes back even before COINTELPRO, when the FBI forcibly deported people whose politics they didn't like. So when I appear before the parole board, they no longer care at all about the facts of my conviction. They ask me about the groups who recognize me as a political prisoner, 
for my radio commentaries. They ask about disciplinary fabrications contrived by Trevor Clark, the former prison system lawyer who ran the torture program for the FBI and sexually assaulted me. And the parole board doesn't care that all of Clark's contrivances are illegal, prohibited as retaliation under the Prison Rape Elimination Act, a federal statute. So the parole board, in considering Clark's retaliatory contrivances, become accessories to rape. They don't seem to care. They asked me about my previous run for governor and then creatively contend that my campaign slogan constitutes a threat on the life of the Ohio governor. The slogan was, turn your ballot into a bullet and blast it through the brain pan of the body politic. Never mind that you can't stuff a paper ballot into the chamber of a gun and blast it out the barrel. Never mind that no governor or any other person is even mentioned in the slogan. Never mind that a campaign slogan is political speech or that the Supreme Court has very narrowly defined what threats are or that no one has ever accused me of misconduct related to the slogan or that the parole board cannot legally charge me and convict me of misconduct without due process on the spot and then extend my captivity for five years. Never mind that no one rational who ever heard what I said interpreted my slogan the ridiculous way they did. But that's what they do. They're right-wing hate mongers, hierarch radicals and bigots. And their principal aim is to tame, crush, or obliterate anyone who dares question their vision of a neo-fascist future. The dystopian control state nightmare they themselves are instrumental in manifesting. The parole board's golf buddies have tortured me, sexually assaulted me, black-sided me, plotted my murder to look like a suicide, illegally renditioned me to another state, and every five years, the parole board awards those state terrorists five more years to grind me down, not because of a criminal conviction from 1991, but because of who I am, what I know, and what I articulate to you about them. Statements like this. They operate according to the logic and motives of crime bosses, crossing out their enemies. They see themselves as gods, answerable to no one. Thin-skinned, arrogant, capricious, pretentious, and childishly vindictive. They are, quite accurately, the perfect antidote for the larger system that keeps you hyper-surveilled and under control. Kevin Baxter, Gary Moore, Trevor Clark, and the Ohio Parole Board are not just some one-off, an anomaly that happened to me because of terrible luck or bad karma or unwise choices on my part. They are, collectively, everything government is, what it has always really striven to become, and what it will now always be, corruption, tyranny, and violence disguised as democracy and freedom. They are Humvees with mounted machine guns pointed at unarmed crowds in Ferguson. They are Apache attack helicopters hovering around the perimeter of your world. They are AI technologies listening to your phone calls and browsing through your emails and Instagram pics. I'm not saying the government is your enemy. I'm saying the government doesn't really try to conceal it from you, that it fears you, resents you, reviles you, and it is perfectly prepared to eliminate you if its metadata collection indicates you might pose some potential future threat. I'm saying the folks in charge who create the social and political and economic dynamics that burn the rainforests and overfish the oceans and melt the permafrost are more than happy to neutralize you in a nuthouse or a supermax prison or a morgue if you even think about getting in the way of the lifeless, smoldering future they currently orchestrate. I hope this doesn't depress you and leave you despondent. I hope you don't feel like everything is hopeless. It's not. While the reality confronting us tells us we're doomed if we do nothing at all, that should really be quite liberating. All things being equal, we're already dead. The bad guys won. We are now digging our own graves to kneel down and await the final pistol shot. 
So, what incentive is there to tuck our chins, to lower our gazes, and to march in lockstep back to the drudgery of our wage slavery jobs? Once we acknowledge that we are population statistics on a dying planet, what is there to fear? We have only one method left available to us to reclaim our purpose and meaning, joy and dignity. Resist. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're celebrating June 11th, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A24. 3205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio 44505 You can find his past writings updates on his case here's past audio find out how to get his books plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org This is the Final Straw Radio the show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 610 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop.